manner, but uh, we're going to begin the eighth chapter of Luke. So please uh, turn there in this eighth chapter after the account that we covered last time of the uh, starkly contrasting responses to Jesus from uh, Simon the Pharisee and the sinful woman that concluded the seventh chapter. We pick back up with the Lord's habit of journeying with his disciples from place to place, proclaiming the word, performing uh, deeds of mercy along the way. And large crowds, we know, uh, met him wherever he went. I, I said in our last lesson that he was something of the talk of the town or, or the talk of the towns. And that will continue to be the case until the time when the majority, as we know, will turn on him and shift from following him to opposing him, even wanting to see him killed. In our passage this morning, we come upon uh, this well-known uh, parable Jesus told of the sower, the seed, and the soils. Uh, but more, if you will quickly uh, scan these 21 verses that we're going to read, because Luke begins in the first three verses with uh, a typical progress report that he likes to give, incorporating though some women who ministered to Jesus and the traveling party. And then there's the parable <clears throat> and then the um, interpretation of the parable, a note about the reason he spoke in those parables in verses nine and 10. Then another short parable about a lamp that is meant to shine. And lastly, a somewhat puzzling remark about uh, his true family. But they all relate to the same thing, uh, which is the critical importance of how an individual responds to the proclamation of the Word of God. So we're going to read the passage and when we get toward those last two pericopes, I'm not going to say a whole lot about that toward the end of the lesson, but as we read them, think. They're all talking about, in Jesus' uh, words, all talking about much the same thing. Uh, soon afterwards, verse 1, he began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The twelve uh, were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. And Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward. And Susanna, and many others who were contributing to their support out of their private means. When a large crowd was coming together and those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable. The sower went out to sow his seed and as he sowed, some fell beside the road and it was trampled underfoot and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on the rocky soil and as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among uh, the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. Other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. As he said these things, he would call out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant, and he said, to you, it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest, it is in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those beside the road are those who have heard, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. Then on the rocky soil, uh, those on the rocky soil are those who, uh, when they hear, uh, receive the word with joy. And these have no firm root. Uh, they believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. The seed which fell among the thorns, uh, these are the ones who have heard and as they go, notice as we go through here, the thing that characterizes them all, they've all heard. 
they've all heard. Um, uh, uh, so the, uh, those, uh, the seed which fell among the thorns, those are the ones who have heard. And as they uh, go on their way, they are choked with worries and, and riches and pleasures of this life. Such, such, a, such a, a true statement. Worries, riches, and pleasures and bring no fruit to maturity. But the seed in the good soil, uh, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. Now, uh, no one after lighting a lamp, and so the sense is here, we're continuing with this idea uh, now, it's a little short conjunction and it can mean many different things, but here the sense, Let's keep going with this thought. Now, no one after lighting a lamp covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand so that those who uh, come in may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. So take care how you listen. Uh, For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has shall be taken away from him. And his mother and brothers came to him, and they were unable to get to him because of the crowd. And it was reported to him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wishing to see you. But he answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. As we reflect upon this period of our Lord's ministry, it's important that we capture the energy and the special uh, phenomenon of large crowds following after uh, him wherever he went. And here he looks out upon yet another vast uh, crowd coming together to hear him. And it appears that he begins uh, to ponder the many hearts that were there and all the different stories represented uh, by this throng of people. There was never a man as perceptive uh, as the Lord. He knew what was in the heart of, of men and women. And as he witnessed the various outcomes of his teaching, uh, some believing him, uh, others disbelieving, he discerned that the same words that came out from his mouth drew very different responses depending on the listeners. And then we note then that twice in our passage, Jesus emphasizes their hearing. In verse 8, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And again in verse 10, take care how you listen. It's as if he is messaging that there is more to understand what he's to, to understanding what he is saying than just hearing the story. And so this first uh, primary parable has something to do with what is going on in the ears and the hearts of the many different people who are listening to the Lord uh, teach and give the gospel. And what is going on has very much to do with the progress of the kingdom of God and the gathering in of its citizens. This parable tells us why some hear the word of the kingdom and believe it, and others hear the same thing and resist it. As unusual as that seems, it's not to us because we experience it over and over again, but on the surface, that's a very unusual thing but it's the most commonplace observation. There are children of Christian parents and amongst the siblings, uh, one may believe or two, uh, but one, uh, the black sheep, one may not. Uh, They simply don't absorb it. Um, They're not interested in spiritual things. Or the gospel is proclaimed in a congregation or to an assembly or to a stadium full of people, and some believe, but others do not. This parable enlightens us on how that could be. As Jesus uh, looked out upon yet another throng, he 
tells a story meant to explain the phenomenon and, understand, and underscore the vital importance of how a person receives the word of God when it's cast his way. But Luke begins by setting the context and providing some seemingly incidental information about their traveling uh, band. They were on something of a circuit, uh, going from one city or village to another, and Jesus, Luke says, was proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. He mentions that the 12 were uh, with him and quickly adds a, a list of women who also traveled with them and who had been healed by Jesus of, he, Luke says, Ill, evil spirits and, and sicknesses. Uh, Luke almost nonchalantly uh, mentions these women as if it were not at all unusual, but it was not typical at this time for women to be allowed to participate in undertakings uh, like this. The rabbinic tradition would not even allow a woman to, to be taught. And they were generally considered, you've been taught this before, to have the inferior place in the important matters of life. But our Lord held women in high esteem. And two, at least of the women mentioned here, would later figure as witnesses both of Christ's crucifixion and more importantly, of his resurrection, Mary Magdalene and uh, Joanna. And so Luke, you know, our historian uh, gospel writer, finds them significant, along with the 12, of course, as having been companions of Jesus Christ from the start almost to the conclusion. You know the names of them, I know, from your readings over the years in the gospels. Uh, but we otherwise know little of them. Mary Magdalene had obviously lived a difficult life. Jesus had cast seven demons from her, and in every instance in which she appears, she, is, she displays great love, great loyalty to the Lord. She stood at the cross, uh, was there when Jesus was buried, and along with the other Mary, uh, went to the tomb early with, uh, to anoint his body. Joanna is mentioned again by Luke in chapter 24, verse 10, as one of the women who uh, reported the empty tomb to the disciples, but nothing more is said of her, nor of her husband, uh, Cusa, uh, identified here as Herod's steward. He had some role within that administration. More than that, we can't really, we cannot say, and, and this is the only mention we have of Susanna. The women uh, went along with Jesus and the 12, and they supported them out of their own resources. They took what they had and used it to minister to uh, their Lord. And so there's a lesson there, and, and we see it week by week uh, here in the ministries at Believers chapel, uh, the ministries that take place here. We have many, many saints serving the Lord uh, amongst this uh, body, and they do it uh, figuratively, I would say, out of the resources that God has given them. But more important, and we don't want to miss the main point, is Jesus's activity. What was he doing? He was proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The concept of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is a rich, rich concept in the Bible and uh, one we cannot give full treatment uh, to here today. Uh, but after Jesus was resurrected, so uh, fast forward uh, a bit, uh, Luke tells us in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, that he appeared to the disciples over a period of 40 days, speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. And so that would make one think that he had in mind that future manifestation of the kingdom that was yet to come. Even after he had accomplished his saving work and he'd risen from the, the dead, uh, the scriptures speak to that uh, future kingdom in many places as being an earthly kingdom that will last for a thousand years. 
But in the early days of his earthly ministry, he is described by Mark in Mark 1, verse 14, as coming into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So in the context of our parable this morning, we can certainly say that those hearers on whom the word of God sown in their hearts, uh, who was sown in their hearts, who bow to the king and they believe in his gospel and bear fruit unto him, show by their allegiance that they had been made citizens of the kingdom, though it may not yet be visible on earth. And when the apostle Paul uh, began ministering to the Gentiles, now, for example, use Acts 19 verse 8, uh, he would enter the synagogue and he would begin to reason and persuade them about the kingdom of God. And he could later write in Colossians 1.13 that our heavenly father had rescued us from the, what a glorious statement, had rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So I think we can summarize by saying that Jesus' ministry at this point was to preach the word of God and particularly that the only means to citizenship in God's kingdom and the realization of participation in his sovereign, beneficent rule was through faith in him and the work of salvation he had come to fulfill. Amen. And that's why he had come, and that was his ministry through word and deed, and the crowds following after him would do so only until such time as they accepted that message or for many uh, finally rejected it. But now here, uh, Jesus is telling of the parable of the seed and the soils. Luke begins to relate in uh, verse 4. And I hope I don't throw you off here, but because this is the first and primary parable in the gospel, and because you're familiar with it already, I'm going to treat first uh, the reason Jesus made use of parables in his teaching. So that will consist, if you have an outline, of verses 4 and verses 9 through 10. And then we will treat the four soils or the four hearts uh, one by one, along with the Lord's interpretation of each. So verse 4 reads, <clears throat> When a large crowd was coming together, and those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable. Now, technically speaking, a, a parable is a, is a story taken from real life or a real life situation from which a moral or a spiritual truth is derived. And our parable before this, us this morning is acknowledged to be teaching a spiritual truth. I called this the primary parable, <clears throat> and that's for several reasons. For one, it's found in each of the synoptic gospels, uh, but also it illustrates at the beginning what is the key to understanding the parables and believing in the kingdom of God in the first place. It gives us a picture of beginnings. Uh, most importantly, it was accorded first place in our, by our Lord's estimation. Luke doesn't record this, but Mark uh, did when his disciples sought to know the meaning of the parable of the soils, just as in our passage in Luke, Jesus asked them, this is Mark 4 verse 13, do you not understand this parable how will you understand all the parables? In other words, this parable is the key to deciphering all the others. But almost by definition, a parable requires a careful thought. It requires study in order to discern the meaning behind it. And used by Jesus, it was designed to both reveal, this is powerful, this is amazing, it was designed to both reveal and conceal depending upon the individual hearer. 
And Jesus made that clear to his disciples in verse 10 now, when he explained to them that they were part of one group of hearers to be distinguished from a very different group. He said, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is in parables so that, and here he borrows a bit of scripture out of Isaiah chapter 6, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. And we must go back to that scene in Isaiah uh, chapter 6. If you don't mind, I'll refresh your memory about it. Uh, but Isaiah had received a great and awesome vision of the Lord sitting on a throne in his temple. And the atmosphere uh, was filled with his holiness and glory. And the seraphim were crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And as the foundations tremble and the temple filled with smoke, Isaiah, remember, was struck by his own sinfulness, uh, crying out, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean uh, lips. And, uh, uh, but the Lord, remember, took that burning coal from the altar and he had it uh, placed on Isaiah's Lips, so that his iniquity was taken away. And then the Lord cried out, Whom shall I send, and, and who will go for us? And Isaiah responded, Here am I, send me. And then followed uh, the command that Isaiah go and tell the people, Keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return and be healed. Well, on the surface, uh, that seems like an almost cruel assignment uh, to ask the prophet to deliver a message meant to deter the recipients from the healing available to them and which they desperately needed. But Isaiah was obedient to his commission and he went from there and he brought to the people uh, the word of God, as we all know. Uh, he didn't deliberately make his message difficult to understand. In fact, <clears throat> he was very straightforward in calling them back to God in repentance and faithfulness but it was the plain word of God that served to do exactly what God had ordained that it would do. They rejected it again and again, and the more they rejected it, the harder their hearts became, their hearts became insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim, and they were unable to understand and return and be healed. But Jesus' disciples uh, were different than those. And they ought to have grasped the meaning of the parable because they had received ability as a gift. It had been granted to them to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And as we'll see, uh, this answer, follow me here, this answer to the disciples about the parable is to some degree the same as the meaning of the parable. Uh, that one's ability to receive and understand and accept the good news of the kingdom is entirely dependent upon the condition of the soil on which that seed is sown. In Jesus' response, we see the parable has something of a double function. Uh, two groups of people here. Uh, one, however, fails to appropriate it, but the other hears it, receives it gladly with understanding and faith. And so the parable itself reflects the message within it. Well, I want to make special note of this. At the end of the eighth verse, look there, is... As Jesus concluded his parable, he exhorts all the hearers, 
He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But not everyone that day that was there hearing the parable of the soils had ears uh, to hear. And, and yet Jesus exhorted them uh, to hear. At the same time, some of them had been given a gift. And that's what he says in, in verse 10. To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And that introduces a new a term in Luke's gospel, mystery, not really new for most of you students of the Bible, but mysteries or, or secrets when used in the Bible are truths which we could never have discovered on our own because they're hidden, but which have now been revealed by God. Later in the parable of the lamp in verse 17, look there, the Lord will refer again to these hidden and secret things. And there he'll have in mind how the testimonies of those who have heard the word with good hearts will be his agents in unfolding these, these mysteries. But here in verse 10, he's describing <clears throat> two classes of people confronted with a single event who respond completely differently. There are only two classes of people described in our parable also, as we shall see, represented by the good soil on the one hand, uh, yielding a bountiful crop, and by these other unfruitful soils. But here there are two types of people, <coughs> those who have been given an ability to understand Jesus' message as a gift, and those who have not, uh, both are responsible uh, to hear and to accept the truth of the mystery, and both, uh, without this gift, would be unable to. Only the one who has received the gift actually hears and believes, and the rest, Jesus says, uh, must make do uh, with parables. But we have this very familiar uh, parable laid out beginning in verse 5. There is a sower, his seed, and the soils into which he casts his seed. Uh, Jesus' audience would have been very comfortable with this imagery for this, this, these were agricultural uh, communities. Farmers would typically take their bag of seed and walk through the fields, uh, casting the seed as they walked, covering the ground wherever they Walk because it was the practice at the time to plow the field after you had sown uh, the seed. And inevitably, there would be found the types of soils uh, described in the parable, well-trodden uh, paths through the fields, uh, shally, shallow, rocky soils with little room uh, for a root system. That soil not always visible uh, before it was plowed, but it, that kind of soil was there. Uh, soils infested by thorns and, and, and uh, weeds, and then ideally much good fertile soil. In the Lord's parable, it's, it's easy to identify what each image was meant to portray. The, the sower was, in the immediate circumstance, our Lord uh, himself, but eventually his followers uh, would imitate him in sowing the seed. The seed was uh, the word of God. Uh, containing uh, the gospel message. And that's what Jesus says in, in verse 11. And the soils uh, represented the many diverse hearts on the receiving end of the sower's sow sowing. And it is the soils that play the leading role in the parable. Over the years, they've been variously described. You probably have your favorite designations, but I'm going to describe the hearts represented by the four soils as the hard heart, the shallow heart, the infested or divided heart, and the good heart. We're introduced to the hard heart at the beginning in verse 5. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air uh, ate it up. And then he interprets it uh, for the disciples in verse 12. Uh, this type of soil represents those who have heard. Uh, then uh, the devil comes and takes away the word uh, from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. 
uh, G.H. Lang uh, called this the impervious heart. I know that word <clears throat> from the world of real estate development, mostly in the city of Austin. A, a great deal of attention is paid to what they call impervious uh, coverage when you're building something new in the city of Austin uh, because of the aquifer issues that they have there. And so if you have very hard ground that won't absorb absorb uh, the water, or if con worse, concrete, like a parking lot, uh, it, it won't allow the rainwater to penetrate it, and it will impede the ability of the aquifer to recharge. So the surface is just too hard, and it will not allow water to penetrate the soil, and you can't grow a seed in it uh, either. But this is figurative language. <clears throat> These are hard hearts Jesus is talking about. The world is filled with them, uh, the type of people described in Romans 1, for example, uh, that which God has made known, he has made known to them, uh, clearly seen in his creation. But they won't honor him or give thanks in futility. They exchange that kind of glory for the base things of this world. Now, they come uh, in, in different uh, packages. Some, some of them are, are just really stupid. Uh, they uh, really dumb. They're, they're simple people with simple desires, uh, being far too easily pleased. They content themselves with recreation and thoughtless pursuits. They care not for anything more than the game, the beer, the boat, and they make it through the week, don't they? And then they go back and they do it again. They, they don't understand the gospel. They could care less. They could not care less about it. <clears throat> then there's the arrogant man or woman, uh, full of pride <clears throat> and scared to death to admit that they might have needs. They don't have needs uh, because they've met their own needs uh, via their inner ambition, which they're quite proud of, or, or wits, or charisma, or looks, or personality. Uh, Christianity is for weak people who are not as strong as they are. And then there's the busy uh, man or a woman, they are busy, busy businessmen, and uh, they've got so many irons in the fire, that's what they tell you, we've got, I've got so many irons in the fire, and it's all good, and they don't have time to think about esoteric ideas like sin and holiness and, and judgment. And when the seed is, is sown, um, do you recognize those people? We run into them all the, the time. When the seed is sown among these hard soils, <clears throat> when the gospel goes out to them, it bounces off. It bounces off, and while they go up, uh, off to the ball game or back to the office or the society ball, it's evident that say, Satan has been walking along uh, beside them, uh, making sure the path stays firm and picking up the seed whenever it falls their way. The next soil is uh, the rocky soil from verse 6. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no uh, moisture. And Jesus' interpretation is in verse 13. This heart is too shallow. At first, when they hear, they receive the word with joy, but since they have no firm root, uh, they believe for a while, and in time of temptation, uh, fall away. So th th these are the pretty uh, wildflowers in early spring. Oh, they're so beautiful. But summer's coming. Summer is coming. Uh, the columbine in the back bed, long gone. No more columbine. Uh, just like the memories of the many we remember who took a swim through our church or through our lives and their Excitement was contagious, but it, it blossomed only for a moment, and when difficulties arose in their lives or temptations, they, they raised the white flag, they moved on to something more promising, and yet in the end, quite ephemeral. Their interest in the gospel was shallow because they never really established a root of sincere faith deep down. And their Christian profession was just that. It was a profession. It was not real. Uh, John, you know, wrote of them in 1 John 2, 19. <clears throat> they went out from us, 
that they were not really of us, for if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. The third soil uh, described in verse 7 represents the infested heart. In this key case, the, the seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and, and choked it out. The Lord's interpretation is in uh, verse 14. Uh, these are the ones who have heard, and they go on their way, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. In an extremely wealthy society, such as the one that, that we live in, uh, this is an especially pernicious danger. Uh, what begins as a spark of interest in the gospel with its promise of uh, forgiveness and eternal blessing somehow gets tripped up by the distractions of the here and now. Uh, thorns crowd in and they begin to crowd out that initial interest so that soon they begin uh, to take precedence over knowing God and having a relationship with Him, uh, leading them to forsake true faith. Communion with God, a close walk uh, with him, uh, those require diligence. Those require a care, just like a fruitful garden or field. Thorns and weeds don't require anything but negligence. The Bible speaks often of the dangers of the love of money. That was the rich young ruler's stumbling block. He was unwilling to part with the pleasures of the wealth that he had in exchange for a life of following Jesus. I've told this story uh, before in the past, but Thomas Jefferson had a daughter, Patsy, uh, who was being educated in a convent near uh, Paris while Jefferson was serving in, in France. And while in the convent, uh, Patsy became troubled about the condition of her soul and about sin and, and judgment. And, uh, she, she decided to become a nun. Thomas Jefferson's daughter decided to become a nun, and she communicated that to her father in a letter. <clears throat> Jefferson was startled by this, but he didn't write her back. Instead, uh, he sent for her uh, to come to the legation in Paris, in, in Paris, where without even waiting for her to complete that education at, at the convent, he immediately introduced his daughter, age 17, uh, into the brilliant scenes of the court of Louis XVI, where she soon forgot her pious plans. Great wealth has a way of distracting us from more important matters. And I'm going to skip down a little bit. The good heart, the seed that fell into the good soil and grew up. Uh, Verse 8, it produced a crop a hundred times as great. Uh, these are the ones, uh, Jesus explains in verse 15, who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. The seed sown upon the good soil uh, does not bounce off with no effect, uh, neither does it shrivel when adversity meets it. It is not infested by competing interests. Instead, it bears much fruit. And as the harvest comes in, it's revealed for what it is. It's a heart in which a, a real planting has taken place that has been fertilized and watered by the Holy Spirit. And there's much rejoicing at harvest time. So we, uh, each of us, don't we ask ourselves, is my heart a good and open heart? Has the gospel uh, rooted down deep in my soul to bear fruit for the master gardener? If not, we must flee to him and ask him to turn our heart of stone into a heart of flesh, a good heart with a good harvest. Well, we read uh, the last six verses of our passage, the lamp meant to shine, and Jesus' true family, as I have 
uh, uh, phrase them in the, in the outline, but we have little time remaining to explore them. Fertile hearts resemble shining lamps. Fertile hearts resemble shining lamps, bearing witness so that others may see the light as well. A light that is truly a light will perform as a light ought. It won't be hidden so that it's ineffective. What is genuine, one of the commentators summarized, what is genuine can and will be tested for its authenticity. And the little big net that Luke folds in at the end, of course, does not picture the Lord being hateful to his his family. He loved his family. He loved his mother. Even when he was suffering on the cross, he took time to take care of her and, and arrange for the future. The lesson of the verse is in plain sight. My family are those who hear the word of God and do it. That's my family. He who has ears to hear, let him hear, Jesus says. And again in verse 18, take care. Take care how you listen. How we listen and how we conform our lives in consequence of that listening will tell us the, the condition of our hearts. So this first uh, primary parable has everything to do with what is going on in the ears and the hearts of the many different people who are listening to the teaching of the Lord and, 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 and hear the gospel. It tells us why some hear the word of the kingdom and believe it, and others hear the same thing and resist it. There is a discriminating nature to the Lord's gracious call to faith. Uh, verse 18, and I'm closing with this. Verse 18 is a, a key verse. It's a warning to all. Take care how you listen, for whoever has <clears throat> to him more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, shall be taken away from him. Uh, many people, including some of the highest ranking uh, officers and leaders among the Jewish people, had heard unvarnished truth from Jesus, and they rejected it. They rejected it. And the result would be that even that truth would be lost to them. And the scriptural principle is clear. Those who receive truth and act upon it will receive more. But those who reject truth will ultimately lose the little they have. The Bible's full of sober truths like that. And this is one of them. Uh, but the invitation is real. Hear the word of God and receive it gladly. Guard it, nurture it, and the Lord of the harvest will create and produce in you a great crop. Why? For his glory. So that for eternity, the universe, all created things will know that our salvation is from his hand. Praise the Lord for that. Otherwise, man, the thorns, everything would be tripping me up. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful uh, for your patience with us because we recognize in these, um, in these soils uh, things that still uh, beckon us. Uh, sometimes we're hard. Uh, the process of sanctification is a long, it's a labor. Uh, thank you for your spirit who does that work in us. Uh, the thorns impinge on us and distract us. Um, sometimes we're very shallow in uh, our approach to day-to-day -to -day living. And we pray, Lord, that you would enable us to produce good crops by your Spirit so that we might give glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen.